The Miami uh, FIU a Creative Class Initiative was put together to generate thoughtfulness, to generate a deep conversation uh, on the state of Miami's economy. And here to discuss the report is someone most certainly you have heard of. You may have not had the privilege of hearing him speak, but you will today. He is Richard Florida. He is director of the FIU Miami Creative City Initiative. Richard Florida is an urbanist. He's a writer. He's a journalist. He's a researcher. He's a professor. He's an entrepreneur. Uh, he's penned several uh, global, global bestsellers, uh, including The Rise of the Creative Class. Uh, a 2013 MIT study named him the world's most influential uh, thought leader. Time Magazine recognized his Twitter feed as one of the 140 uh, most influential uh, in the world. So, we have an incredible opportunity today to have a con to conversation with uh, Richard Florida, uh, and he is going to share with us his presentation titled Miami's Great Inflection Toward a Shared Prosperity as a Creative and Inclusive Global City. Please join me in welcoming Richard Florida. Thank you, buddy. It's so nice to see you, buddy. Well, um, thank you, Mark, uh, for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you. Um, I was in the audience in the other room, and I saw the incredible round of applause and reception you received. Y your leadership here uh, in Greater Miami is something we all appreciate and something you're forward-looking, your ability to see the future and, and to do so for several decades now is something we need and we appreciate. Um, I personally and our team is extremely grateful for your support. Um, Ron and my wife, who's here with us today, who really is the director of this initiative, who provides all of the work, she's the CEO of our company and provides all the organizational support. Um, we wanted to do something for this region when we moved here eight or nine years ago. And Mark uh, and FIU and uh, my great friend, Brian Schreiner, who I see out of the corner, my the dean of CARTA, provided an incredible platform and support for this initiative. And it's something that's very, very special uh, to all of us. Um, I'd like to thank the chamber for providing this platform. And this is the second time I had the opportunity to address the chamber. I got to do it at Jungle Island um, last winter. And also thank the Beacon Council. Larry Williams, who I saw earlier, was very helpful to us in helping Stephen Pettigo, who's our research director and a great guy in the backbone of this study, co-author with me of this study. Larry Williams and the Beacon Council helped us organize uh, a whole series of incredible focus groups where we learned a great deal about this region. Um, look, Mark, Mark said this so eloquently this morning, and we all know it, right? This region has really hit a crossroads. And I've spent a lot of time, folks, I don't want to get too geeky on you, but I am a professor, I am an academic, I've been reading about Miami now, talking to my dear friends at FIU, the great historian Ken Lipartito, who knows so much about this region, uh, going back and reading Alejandro Portes' work, which is incredible. In fact, Alejandro has just taken a part-time appointment at University of Miami from his real home, from his historic home at Princeton, reading the books of Jan Nyman and others. And in that work, they talk about Miami becoming a global city by accident. You know, it's different. You know, I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. New York, you think about the financial center and the industrial center. You think about Detroit with heavy industry or Pittsburgh where I taught at Carnegie Mellon. Miami grew up without that kind of core. I grew up around a port and an airport and tourism and hospitality. It's a very intriguing new model of a post-industrial metropolis. And we have no way of understanding that. There is not a deep academic or even programmatic literature. So one of the things we want to do with this study is begin that conversation this is the opening salvo. We've been working for two years studying this economy, and we're going to continue to do this as part of the FIU Miami Creative Economy Initiative. Uh, look, we're at, as the title of the report says, we're at a great inflection. And so what the report tries to do, and I think you have the executive summary, the report's online, there's been great coverage in the Herald and uh, on public radio and elsewhere. We've tried to outline in a very, it's not a hard reading, trust me, you can get through the report very quickly. The assets that this region has, the strengths that it has, but also the deep challenges we face. Um, 
we've tried to take a really deep dive into the Miami economy. Um, we did the focus groups with the support of the Beacon Council. Um, we did something that's very interesting. We took an incredible look at the 800 occupations, a talent base analysis of our region's strengths and weaknesses. We looked at what we call the three T's of economic development, the three T's which drive economic development, technology. You have to be a technology winner. You have to invest in technology, support R&D at great universities like FIU and the University of Miami. You have to have talent and be able to generate talent support those brains and attract people, and you have to be an open-minded and tolerant region in order to attract people of every stripe. Uh, out of this analysis that we've been doing for the past couple of years, we, we identified 10 areas. I'll be very quick, it won't take all your time. 10 areas of focus and action that all of us as Miamians need to think about. Number one, and I think Mark has been a great leader on this, you know, we've been a little bit of a balkanized community, sorry to say, and Ken Libertito's remarkable study where he went out and interviewed leadership shows this. Uh, we're balkanized into communities by a whole variety of differences. And we're balkanized by geography, by where we live, the communities we live in, the regions we live in. But look, if we're gonna compete on the global playing field, we need a new and cooperative approach to regionalism. We need to be able to leverage all of the size and scale and market power of this great region. Greater Miami, whether you know it or not, is one of the world's largest economic units. We have nearly six million residents and an economic output or GDP of $300 billion. We're a bigger economy than Singapore or Hong Kong. Importantly, and I think this is really important for all of us to recognize, uh, Greater Miami, which is Miami, Miami Beach, Dade County, Broward County, the metropolitan area, and Palm Beach County. Greater Miami, when we talk about that, is the hub of the southern Florida mega regions. In our work, we don't talk about countries, we talk about mega regions. There are 200 countries in the world, but 40 mega regions that power the, US, uh, the world economy. Those 40 mega regions, the New York, Boston, Washington, Carter, Greater London, Greater Tokyo, Seoul, Shanghai, Beijing, Mumbai, Bangalore, and Southern Florida. They house 18% of the world's population. They produce two-thirds of the world's economic output and 90% of its innovations. Our mega region, which extends to Tampa and Orlando, is home to 15 million people and produces nearly a trillion dollars in economic output. It is bigger than the Netherlands, it is one of the world's 20 largest national economies. It is time for us to embrace regional cooperation, to work together as a region here in the county, in the metro, but also across that mega region to leverage those assets. We have the market power to compete with the 20 leading economies in the world and we have to use it. We have to think less as competitors uh, and more as cooperators and part of the same economic entity. Second, we have to do more to leverage this region's role as a hub for globalization. We understand that we're a hub for travel and hospitality and tourism, but look, whether, as, as, as Alejandro Porta says, this happened by accident or not, we are one of the 25 most important global cities in the world. Uh, our airport is one of the greatest in the world, and that's a big part, that is a big, big part. Sun and climate and all of that are important, but a big, big part of why this place is really cooking has to do with that airport and its connections to the world. Not just to Latin America and the Caribbean, to Europe, but as Mark said, to this incredible growth market of Asia. Look, we're gonna put another five or six billion people into cities around the world, and we are connected. One of the 25 cities in the world that are a hub to that, uh, our port which is one of the most important in the world. And that didn't happen by accident. That is a credit to this leadership, mayors, chambers, business leadership, several decades of strategic investment in making sure we have the infrastructure needed to compete. As the Beacon Council's remarkable report on industry clusters said, transportation and logistics is one of the most important industries we have. I've done research on airports I didn't want to believe how important. There are talk, people who talk about the role of the aerotropolis in the world economy, how important it is. I didn't want to believe it. I wanted to believe that technology and talent were the drivers, and they are. 
Having a global airport like we do is one of the three key drivers of economic competitiveness. Along with high-tech industries and having a skilled and talented workforce and talent-based, knowledge-based of brains, that, that global airport adds as much to regional development. It has to be one of our strategic, strategic part. And look, countries around the world, whether we talk about Singapore or Hong Kong or Dubai, are investing like mad to compete with us. That airport is a hub, and we have to keep it as a globalization asset. Mark talked a lot, and the panel's going to talk more about our startup ecosystem. And here there is good news and bad news. The good news is that we're attracting hundreds of millions of dollars a year in venture capital. That's a credit to the work of my dear friend Matt Hagman and the Knight Foundation and all of the ecosystem that Matt and others have built. When we look at the Southern Florida mega region, 600 million in venture capital investment in our startups. That's as much as Toronto or Chicago or Austin. We're a player. This region has ranked second in business formation over the past five years, with a gain of nearly 7,000 new business establishments. This is second only to LA, ahead of New York, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Austin, and others. That's a big deal. But now the challenges. Our startup ecosystem, even though we have a lot of business formation, that's a lot of mom and pop. That's a lot of small businesses. What we really need to do when we talk about this in the report is to go from quantity to quality. That's a big theme of where we have to go. Um, we rank 100th out of 350 regions on our own technology index. The Milken Index, put, Milken index of high tech growth put us 158th out of 200. The problem is that our entrepreneurship up to this point has been relatively low quality. And a report from the MIT uh, Sloan School by dear friends of mine, Scott Stern and Jorge Gozman, look in detail at this. Um, while we form a lot of businesses, we haven't been able to scale them up. To, and that's the real key. We have to scale them up into world competitive. Uh, the Kauffman Foundation's most recent report on this, and they're the leaders on this, uh, found that we had the second fastest growth of the 40 largest metros on business formation and the second to last level of growth among the scale-up companies. So we got to make them uh, bigger. Now, we have an advantage here, and it's really important. My own research with my team has found that startups are shifting. They used to locate in the suburban office parks in the Southern California, Northern California, Silicon Valley, outside of Boston, Austin, you know, where the Googles and the Microsofts and all of the outside of Seattle, Google and outside of Silicon Valley and Apple. They're now moving back downtown. Nearly 60% of all new startups founded in the United States last year were founded in urban downtowns. We have $2 billion startup neighborhoods in the United States, not in Silicon Valley, not in the Route 128 corridor outside of Boston, not in the suburb of Seattle, in downtown San Francisco. The good news is our startups are increasingly clustered in our urban center, around Brickell, uh, around Wynwood, around the design district. I could go on, a little bit in the beach, in other, in other hub areas, around the universities. And this is an important thing we can build because we have the quality of life. We have the quality of place. We have the downtown kind of warehouse buildings that these startups like to be in. Number four, we have to build a fully creative economy. Sometimes we get a little bit too caught up in tech, and of course we have to do tech because tech undergirds everything. But we have 700,000 creative class workers spanning arts, design, creativity, technology, science, business, and the professions. It's 30% of the workforce in this county. In the mega region, we have 1.7 million creative class workers. And this creative class is highly clustered in those downtown urban areas, and again, in the areas around our major universities. We took a deep dive, a deep, 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 deep dive into the region's talent base, creative class base, it's in the report. We know that there are three kinds of creative class talent that power economic growth and they have to work together. You need science and technology talent where we lag a little bit. You need business and financial talent where we do very well. And you need arts, creative, design talent. You know, um, when Viacom just put its major new studio here, we heard this at the meeting this winter, they said the reason they put that studio here is because Greater Miami has an incredible wealth of talent in music, music production, television production, film, and great weather, bilingual. You can do the kind of things here at a fraction of a cost you can do in New York or LA. We have to build upon that. We have to see ourselves not just as a tech economy, but as a fully creative economy. Look, look at what Mike Bloomberg did. 
by understanding that New York was a financial market and needed financial information, but linking that to technology and creating those Bloomberg terminals, he created one of the most important businesses in the world. We can link creativity and the arts and culture to technology, and that can be a driving force for us. Five, and very importantly, we need to build a middle class. That FIU Metropolitan Center study is remarkable, and it shows how deeply divided we are. Like many other great successful cities, like New York, like San Francisco, like Los Angeles, like Chicago, we've turned into two societies, almost gated communities lining our waterfronts, where the world's super rich flock and pay prices that none of us could have even imagined. Would, would shock us even five years ago. And poverty inland. And they talk about this in great detail. I don't need to go into it. We need to build a middle class. My dad worked all of his life in a factory. Uh, he told me that when he started his job, it took nine people to make a family wage in the Depression. When he came back from the war as if by magic, he had a middle class job. We turned factory work into middle class work in this country. FDR, the New Deal, and all of that. We took crappy work that took nine people to make a living wage and turned it into something my dad could buy a house and put myself and my brother through high school, and Catholic school, and college. We have 1.3 million people working in low-wage service jobs. The average salary is $32,000 in travel and hospitality and retail trade. I could go on. They make less than half of what we in the creative class make. We have to upgrade that work, and I think this is a challenge the chamber should take on. Miami, second to Las Vegas in the world in its concentration of service, low-wage routine service jobs. They don't have to be that way. My great friend Zynette Tom at MIT, who I've been working with closely, has written an incredible book and done an incredible study called The Good Job Strategy. We can get Zynette up down here to talk with us. She has found at MIT that just as in manufacturing, when you involve workers at the point of production, when you tap their intelligence, when you get them innovating, when you get them doing quality, you get a tremendous rise in productivity and quality, and you can pay them more. Same thing in services, whether it's Zara or Whole Foods or Wegmans or Four Seasons, and she goes down the list. The companies that pay workers more and involve them in innovating in retail, in travel, in hospitality. They get that worker's brain power, they deliver higher quality services, and they're more profitable and more productive. It's a win-win-win, think about it. The workers win by having more money, more in their pocket. They can spend more money and help drive the economy. The companies win because they're innovation and productivity and profit, and we win because when the workers are more engaged in service economy, they provide better customer service, which leads to more people wanting to come in business. With our service companies, with our cruise lines, with our hospitality, travel and tourism, this needs to be a centerpiece of where we go, not just for business productivity, but for rebuilding our middle class. Six, Mark said this, it is frustrating to every one of us to hear the conversation about brain drain in this economy. Our kids are leaving to go to New York. My kid went up to Columbia and stayed there, and there's more to do in New York and L.A., and they love London. Yeah, fine. The best kids from New York leave. The best kids from Boston. I've done the study. The best kids from Boston leave. The best kids from Chicago leave. Kids want to go somewhere new. We are a winner in brain circulation, and that's the way we need to think about it. We have millions of people from all over the world dying to come here, rich and poor alike. We are the most diverse in terms of foreign-born metro in the world. We're home to nearly 450,000 college students. We are the eighth largest college town in the country. We are 16th in the nation at retaining our college kids. So yes, some go away, but more than them stay. We have higher retention than DC, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Boston, the list goes on. FIU's retention rate is 70%. Miami-Dade College is 81%. University of Miami is 50%. These are startling numbers. It's good when some people go away because our brains circulate. And as the best studies of Silicon Valley and San Francisco and high-tech regions show, when people come and go and circulate, when Indian and Chinese and foreign-born entrepreneurs come to a place and go back and start businesses there, it creates a flow of trade which benefits everyone. Seven, 
build on the fact that we are one of the very most open, diverse, and tolerant economies and regions in the world. Four in 10 of us come from a different country. We rank 16th in the nation on our open-mindedness towards the gay and lesbian community. By the way, Orlando ranks very closely behind us. And I can't help but believe that the attack in Orlando was driven by the fact that that community has been a beacon for the gay and lesbian community for so long. I've done a lot of work going back to Mayor Hood there. I know that community very well. Uh, we have to be resilient and double down on our openness and diversity because it's so important. We rank in the top 20 on my Bohemian Index, which is a measure of our arts and culture, musical professionals. When we look at all the measures of tolerance and diversity and open-mindedness towards the gay and lesbian community, towards ethnic minorities, towards religious minorities, towards the everyone, we rank second in the nation. Diversity and tolerance are more than social virtues, they're economic drivers. My own research has done a lot on this. We find strong associations between openness to the foreign-born community, gay community, all of these communities and economic growth in addition to having talent and technology. But not just my research, an incredible set of studies by the Peterson Institute of International Economics, looking across all the nations of the world, shows that nations that are open to immigrants in the gay community gain an incredible premium in competing on the global market. They're wealthier and they're more competitive. Number eight, use our quality of place, not our, just our quality of life as an economic driver. Quality of place, I mean the assets that we have as a community. Um, I remember when the New World Symphony opened and I was part of the panel with Frank Gehry and the architects who did, the landscape architects who did the park were asked, why did you want to do this uh, project? And they said, because who wouldn't want to come to Greater Miami? You have great water, you have great beaches, you have great sunshine, you're not dark and you know cloudy like the Netherlands. We all know that. But the quality of place goes far beyond this. It is about our architecture, some of the most incredible historic architecture across genres in the world. You know, our skyline has now become as iconic as the great skylines of the world. Our mid-century modern buildings, and I could go on and on about this. And yes, we're becoming expensive, and in certain parts of our coastline are expensive, but when we look at housing prices compared to New York and London, we're still a bargain. And that's why people are moving here, very wealthy people to come here, but also young chefs, young musicians, young artists, young techies to start their businesses because not only is housing more affordable than those, you can get the space you need to run your business. Our quality of place can and should be a considerable competitive asset. Number nine, I've talked about this, we have to become a more inclusive community. We are the seventh most unequal metro in the nation. We can't stand for that. 14% of our households and one in five of our families are living in poverty, according to that incredible FIU Metropolitan Center study. This isn't just about mitigating poverty. I want to make this a point. It's about rebuilding our middle class and using all the talent we have. I know this because I grew up in a poor community in New Jersey. I was born in Newark. I saw the carnage left behind. My dad only had a seventh grade education. I'm one of the few kids. I got a Garden State scholarship to Rutgers. I'm one of the few kids in my neighborhood who made it. Those kids were smarter, they were tougher, they were more talented and more ambitious than me, but they all got left behind. We need to tap, that's waste. We are wasting so much of our community. We need a concerted effort that the chamber and all of you can help lead to make sure that we tap into all the talent we have. By building a more inclusive community, we can rebuild our middle class and make our economy go stronger. Uh, 10, uh, and this is what my next book's about. This region faces a new kind of urban crisis that is part and parcel of our very success. When uh, metro regions reach the size we do, five and a half, six million people, the old model of growing by using a car and sprawling out into the suburbs ceases to work. It can work. Four, three million, four million, five million, but you all know this. You all see the traffic that we're all stuck in. We have, re and think about this. There's only one New York at 22 million. There's only a couple of regions much bigger than that. A bunch of regions across Atlanta, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Boston, Miami, Toronto, they're all stuck at five and a half to six million people. Why? 
because people can't go get around. And the whole regional economy starts to clog. Our urban metabolism, which should get faster and faster and faster, we should go quicker, get around more quickly. Our velocity and speed should be better. But as we get bigger, we start to clog up and seize up. Um, Miami's workers face a one-way commute of nearly a half an hour longer than San Diego or Dallas. The average greater Miami commuter wastes more than a week of work annually stuck in traffic. We lose more than $3 billion, folks who run businesses, $3 billion in lost productivity. We need to change the way we grow. If this will be key, if we can do this, we'll succeed and we'll prosper and we'll compete with the great global cities. And if not, we'll be okay. We'll be where we are now and we won't get much better. We're doing some of this, but we have to do more. We are shifting from sprawl to denser development, but we need even more density. We need more bigger buildings. We need to build even more housing. We need, density is not just a way to house people, it's the key driver of innovation. The closer people are together, the more we mix and mingle, the more we combine and decombine, the more innovative we are. We need better investment in transit here, and fortunately we're starting to get it. Finally, but we need to regalvanize ourselves for transit that connects the hubs in this region. And importantly, we need better and better transit to connect us to the other nodes in the mega region. All aboard Florida is a first step, but we really need full on high speed rail. Imagine the power that can come if we really have this mega region of nearly a trillion dollars in economic output connected. Anyway, we face a critical inflection point. That's why, my ha that's why Mark's leadership and this chamber's work is so important. And all of the work of all of the great business and civic leaders. You know, I spend part of my time in Toronto, and I need to tell you this. The most important thing we do differently in America is we're not just a government-powered economy. In almost any other economy in the world, the government, the local government, the provincial government, the federal government runs the show. Here in the United States, through work of groups like the Chamber, the Beacon Council, we have pursued a new kind of leadership model which is full-on civic, business, academic engagement with universities and university leadership at the core. This is an incredible advantage in mobilizing our community. Look, our growth up to this point has occurred largely by an accident of our geography, good luck, and a little strategic thinking. We're now the sixth largest metro. We're bigger than Singapore and Hong Kong. We're one of the 20 largest economies in the world uh, when we compare ourselves as a mega region. We have a lot of advantages, but we do have a lot of challenges to overcome. I guess the point that I want to end on, I'm looking so forward to talking with the panelists. Fortuity has brought us a long way. And we're so lucky to have Mark in this leadership role and all of you. But the time has come from a really serious, proactive, and forward-looking vision. We can no longer grow by an accident anymore. We've got to double down our, invest, uh, our investments and our focus on really building a great global city and the infrastructure and actions that it takes to do that. Our report is just the first. We look at it, as Mark said, as a conversation starter. We look at it as a way to help stir the pot, get all of you thinking. We don't have all of the answers, please. We can try to pose the issues as best as we see them. We look forward in working with Mark, with FIU, on this Creative City initiative with the Chamber and all of you over the next several years. Uh, to try to make the most of what is already an incredible place to live and work. Thanks so much.